Full term. Hello, it's like 20 slides. We're gonna get going. I think most committee members are here. Uh, I see a couple more straggling in. Um, Jenna is actually gonna do the first introduction. There's the very short, quick introduction. Oh my. <laughs> uh, don't look, everyone close your eyes. <laughs> There on the right. All right, so we all know and love Leah, and we are very excited to hear about the science she's been doing. But I wanted to pass along some gleams of, or gems of insight from my experience getting to know Leah after, over the, la the last six years, especially to the grad students in the audience. So, how to make your PhD feel like a party with Leah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. So the first thing that Leia does is to get very organized. So grabs her right in the rain notebook if she's going into the field, maybe does some planning on a spreadsheet on the couch. And if you're like Leia, you're both organized in science but also in your personal life. And you can see on the bottom here a 25 tab <laughs> spreadsheet of all of the Bond movies, which we all watched at Leia's house, <laughs> um, organized as to who's going to bring what dish. And even in the face of obstacles to organization, such as what is presented by some of her friends who refuse <laughs> to actually commit to anything, Leia continues to be organized and get things done. The next thing to be aware of for making your PhD a party is to select a great venue. So if you are going to be doing field work, a lot of your time will be spent um, at your field sites, but you're also going to spend a lot of time doing other things, so you might need to explore your options, um, go on a road trip, see what the local area has, <laughs> go check out some different climates, um, and maybe even in your own home, just make your own home feel like a really festive space. <laughs> Very important for making your PhD feel like parties to have appropriate uh, food, which Leah has really excelled at over the course of her time here, and I'm sure throughout her whole life this is a big priority, and it really makes things fun. Um, and bringing different foods from around the world and introducing people to a, um, a lot of new things has been one of the best things I think that we all have enjoyed about getting to know Lake. <laughs> um, you must dress appropriately, whether you are <laughs> doing field work or obviously being very much of a scientist here with Brian in lab coats. Um, maybe you're going to need to dress appropriately for something that actually involves costumes. Or maybe you just want to be fancy in Corvallis and have limited opportunities, so make your own opportunities. <laughs> and one of the best things that I think we all love about Leah is that she brings lots of people together from lots of diverse backgrounds and different parts of her life and makes everybody into a big group of friends. Um, and one of the best things that she's done is combine her passion for food and science and bringing people together into this annual party. So you can see a lot of us and a lot of people in the audience have gotten to go to these annual parties. She brings different species together, vertebrates <laughs> and invertebrates. <laughs> um, so yes, that's one of the best things about Leah. Um, and one thing that I think we can all really, on a more serious note, sort of, we can take from Leah is um, to not be afraid to try new things. So. Jumping into a whole new part of ecology, like um, freshwater science, and then being the first in her lab to actually do more genetics and molecular things or whatever that you'll learn about later, <laughs> whatever it is that she does. Um, actually going on into new ecosystems and trying, uh, being adventurous and trying new things, especially if you're here in Oregon for a short amount of time, taking advantage. So try something new. And then when you do something great, celebrate it. So if it's because you made a burrito the fastest, or you've done a really great job on your, on your poster, or you're defending your thesis and you have this really awesome website, uh, make sure that you celebrate your successes. So with that, I will pass it back to Mark. <laughs> First, I can't talk that. Um, it's actually step six that I want to talk about. Um, Leia is not afraid to take on the unknown and challenges. And I want to give you three examples. Um, the first is that Leia arrived as a seasoned marine ecologist. Um, she'd worked in Hawaii, she'd worked in Australia, 
She'd worked on uh, urchins and kelp um, and lobsters in California. She'd worked for the Environmental Defense Fund, all doing marine-related stuff. And so naturally, in her first year here, she switched to freshwater streams. <laughs> um, she joined a lab, a green PI, um, who had gotten lucky on an NSF grant to work in streams, but knew nothing about how to work in them. Not, didn't know how to sample them, uh, didn't know how to actually mentor a PhD student working in streams. And so what she did, first summer, she went and worked with professionals. She went out to the USGS, she went out to the um, ODFMW, and spent the season learning um, how to sample streams, learning the skills, and, and even just the, the figuring out what equipment we needed at the lab. She came back and taught us um, how to do stream ecology in the lab. Um, and so for that, the second challenge, um, um, I think I'm grateful to you for getting us set up. Um, the second challenge, you'll get a, you'll get a sense of um, in, in, in some of the chapters, but um, the choice of study organisms, crayfish. Um, crayfish have taken us down some roads that I did not imagine, certainly in the model fitting end of things. Um, but, and, and you might get a taste of that a little bit later. But as Jenna alluded to as well, um, they had also not shy away from moving out of bread and butter ecology. Um, she started working on crayfish microbiomes. And you may be thinking, how, how could Mark ever advise someone working on microbiomes in the genomics? He knows nothing about that. And you'd be right. Um, <laughs> so what did Leah do? She got herself an NSF fellowship. Actually, she got two, but she had to decline one. Um, to go all the way to Sweden and actually learn how to do this stuff. Um, and, and that's what you'll see in her second chapter, or third, third chapter, um, about the work on, on crayfish microbiomes um, that, she, that she managed to, to pull off despite my inabilities, <laughs> inability to advise her on that. Um, and, and then the third set of challenges um, that she hasn't shied away from are the, are the challenges of being underrepresented in science and in your community. Um, and I want to just point out, and, and, and many of you are aware of this, but uh, the amount that Leah has done for our department and for the university, um, the things that she has, she has taken on, um, the, the amount of education she has uh, pursued, uh, not only in her own um, uh, education, but that of, our, uh, of others, the amount of change that she has tried to affect is impressive. And, and just one little data point on that, so to speak, is that in the time that she's been in my lab, she has mentored and, and or advised over 22 undergraduates by bringing them um, into, their, into her own science or through, um, through society programs and things like that has touched on, um, on the lives of individuals. Um, and I think for that, all of us should be grateful. So with that, hit it. Oh, man. <laughs> Jeez, what an introduction. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Mark. That was so heartfelt. And thanks for everyone being here and for the people online. Uh, before I share my science, I want to first acknowledge the people whose land I've conducted most of my research on and will receive my degree from. Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Apanifu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Tre Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Right. So with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about species interactions. And one of the most fundamental interactions there are is that between an organism and its food. Whether that food is plant-based or animal-based or a mixture of the two, every living thing needs food to survive. And that act of eating could help to maintain healthy ecosystems, like this kelp forest seen here. And when unbalanced, that act of eating could transform these landscapes. So for example, um, sea urchins, when they eat too much kelp, could tr transform this lush kelp forest into this urchin barren. So everything that needed that kelp to survive is now gone. And it's all because of this simplistic need to eat. And even though it's a simple need, it could create complex interactions. And as ecologists, we, um, we paint this, these interactions through a food web. So each of these pictures represents a species, and these arrows represent how energy moves through the system. So, for example, kelp gets eaten by urchins, urchins get eaten by sea otters. 
And the widths of those arrows represent how strong those interactions are. So it looks like urchins are, or, um, sea otters are eating a lot of urchins. It's a very simplistic view. Um, it paints this picture that every individual in this population is doing the same thing. So every urchin has the same behavior, same feeding rate, same um, energetic and nutrient demands. But that's not true. Populations are structured, so they're composed of different sizes and ages and different stages, all with their own behaviors and their own demands. So focusing on stage structure isn't new. In fact, a lot of these stage structured models are from single species, and this is commonly used in fisheries. So an example here of how we use stage structure is seeing how a juvenile grows up into different stages. It becomes an adult, it matures, becomes reproductive, makes new juveniles. But what's missing in this picture are the interactions as this individual grows up. And so these are that um, transition between stages is called an ontogenetic niche shift, where as an individual grows up, they might change the habitats that they live in or their diets. And this is um, commonly occurring in coral reef fishes. So they'll spend their juvenile stages in mangroves and then they'll grow up and they'll go out to coral reefs. And this is a way for them to minimize um, predation risk and maximize their growth. And so because they are changing their locations, because they're changing their diets, they're gonna be changing what species they interact with. And this is actually a major gap in food web theory is how species interactions change as an individual grows. And so there's a few ways that interactions could change and I'm just gonna go over three of them. So in the blue dot, it represents a consumer and the red represents the resource. So let's say we're focusing on the stage structure of the resource, so there's a juvenile and adult. It could be that the juvenile gets consumed by the, or gets eaten by the consumer, and maybe the adult stage is safe from, from um, a predator. Or it could be that these two different stages of a resource get consumed by two different consumers. Or this third one, which I'm gonna be focusing on later in the talk, is if there's stage structure in the um, consumer population, and maybe a juvenile eats one resource and a pre or the adult eats the other. So these are just a few ways that interactions change as an individual grows up. And so the ecological consequences of um, stage structure, it can affect population dynamics, community structure, and ecosystem processes. And these are three of the chapters that I'm going to be talking about today. As Mark said, I worked with crayfish as my study system, and I think that they're a great system to study um, these questions, even though they've been kind of a pain. Uh, but I think they're important because they have various roles in streams. So they serve as predators, they eat fish and invertebrates. They are detritivores, so they help to recycle nutrients in streams by breaking down leaf litter and making that available for other things in the streams. They are prey to larger fishes and birds and mammals, and they're ecosystem engineers. So their burrowing activities actually change the morphology of the stream. And as Jenna alluded to, they also have really big cultural significance. So these, for some places, are you know, the defining thing of summer. So not only are they ecologically important, they're actually one of the most widespread invasive aquatic species worldwide. So this is a map showing the distribution of uh, red swamp crayfish. So they're originally found in the southeastern United States, but they've been distributed globally. And this is the case for many crayfish species. And this is a big deal. And the way that they get around is through a variety of vectors. One, they're used as live bait, so people want to fish with lures, but want it to be more realistic. They'll actually hook on an actual crayfish that they you know, move around, catch that fish's attention. Right. They've also been introduced intentionally as a way to um, maintain pathogens. So in Africa, they've been introduced to eat snails that pass on pathogens to humans. They've also kind of been introduced accidentally. So they are beautiful creatures that people keep in aquaria. And so when people are done with their aquaria, they'll just dump out their crayfish, thinking that re they're returning them to the wild. Um, and crayfish are actually are often used as um, classroom pads or for classroom experiments. So in both of these cases, they just get dumped out in local rivers. And that could have um, big implications for the streams that they get dumped in. 
So when they're invasive, they could um, eat way more than whatever native crayfish is around. Um, so the picture I'm showing here is an example of a crayfish that's been introduced to Lake Tahoe, and it's eating this newt that can't be found anywhere else in the world. Where they're introduced, they change nutrient cycling regimes. They're prey for animals that like, didn't have a prey source to begin with in these areas that they've been introduced to. And they've been, they cause major impact on our infrastructure. So this is a picture of a bridge in Oxford. And our crayfish that's been introduced there has actually caused so much damage to the streams that it's causing bank instability. So they'd actually had to close this bridge down. So crayfish could have major impacts. What I find particularly interesting about them is that they have this really interesting life history. So for more, most animals, as they grow bigger, they are able to catch bigger prey, they're able to eat more food. But what's known about crayfish is that they do the opposite. So they have this ontogenetic niche shift. So as juveniles, they eat mostly bugs, and the idea is that they're trying to get a lot of protein so they could grow quickly. And as adults, they eat mostly detritus. And some say the reason for that is that once they get so big, they get too big and bumbly, and they can't quite catch mobile prey. So I found this a really interesting system to ask questions about ecology, about ontogenetic niche shifts. So today I'm going to use crayfish as a study system to look at how stage structure affects population dynamics. We're going to dive into their guts and look at community structure, and then as well as ecosystem processes. And so for population dynamics, I'm going to take a focus on feeding rates. And to do so, we're going to do a little theoret theoretical ecology 101 with Cookie Monster as our study system. All right, so if we want to know the impact that a consumer has on its, on its resource, we need to measure its feeding rates. And that could tell us a lot about how abundances and their populations are going to change over time. So as Cookie Monster is our focal species, what we're going to look at here is the data on its feeding rates. So on the x-axis is resource density. So let's say how many cookies are available. And on the y-axis is how many cookies Cookie Monster ate within a given space, within a given amount of time. And I did all these trials, watch him eat. And the data looks something like this. And there are two patterns I want you to recognize, or want to point out to you. So first, as resource density increases, we see this increase in cookie consumption. So the more cookies there are, the more Cookie Monster could eat. Makes sense. But what we also see is that at some point, that cookie consumption levels off. And so at some point, there are just too many cookies, and Cookie Monster is not fast enough to eat them. And so what we call this is a type 2 functional response. So it's, it describes how a predator's or a consumer's feeding rates saturate uh, with resource density. And it's represented by this equation here. And so the two things that I want to point out about this equation are the A and the H. So A standing for attack rate and H standing for handling time. Right. So for attack rate, you can imagine Cookie Monster searching its space. And so the attack rate represents Cookie Monster moving around, the probability that it's going to run into a cookie, uh, but also the probability that it's going to pick it up. And then the other part to this is handling time. So it's the actual time Cookie Monster takes to handle or kill, ingest, and digest that resource. So these two components, attack rate and handling time, they're not static. And in fact, they could be influenced by an individual's metabolism. So according to the metabolic theory of ecology, Metabolism governs biological processes from individuals all the way up, up to ecosystems. It is um, this grand unifying theory that could predict things about um, growth rates, mortality rates, and for my purposes, feeding rates. And the two things that influence an individual's metabolism is their body size and their temperature. Oh, yes. So can it predict feeding rates? All right, so I'm going to go into the predictions for body size and temperature, or starting with temperature first. So as temperature increases, based on metabolic theory, we could predict that attack rates are going to increase and handling times are going to decrease with temperature. 
And the reason for that is, um, if you are an ectotherm, the warmer it is, the more you're going to be moving around, the most, more likely you're going to run into a resource and probably get it. Whereas if it's cold, you're moving around more slowly, it's going to take you longer <laughs> to get that resource. All right. And then for the patterns with body size, um, we predict that attack rates will go up and handling times will go down. And the reason for that is the bigger you are um, within a given space, the easier it is and the faster you are at, at traveling around that space and bumping into your resource. Whereas if you're smaller in that same amount of space, it's going to take you a longer time to be able to go through that space to find your resource. So we've taken into account body size and temperature with metabolic theory. Um, but what I think what's missing from this theory and from functional response experiments is stage structure. So what happens as an individual goes from juvenile to adult? Um, if they have one diet uh, when they're juveniles and then they switch diets to when they're adults, do these theories still hold true? Luckily, we have a study system in which an organism does that. So because juveniles switch from eating bugs, or sorry, as crayfish switch from eating bugs as juveniles and leaves as adults, do these predictions from metabolic theory hold true if I'm only looking at one type of resource? And so the goals of this chapter are to first explain patterns of feeding rates by body size and temperature, compare the performance of unstructured versus structured functional response models, and estimate body size and temperature dependence of attack rate and handling time. To do so, I had lots of help going into streams at nighttime trying to catch crayfish. Um, so they were collected from the McDonald Dunn Forest, right close to OSU. I also used kick nets to collect larval stoneflies. And I conducted these experiments at the Aquatic Animal Health Lab, which is just down the 34. So if you need any temperature controlled experiments, this is the place to go. All right, so just a little bit about my experimental setup. I had um, arenas that were filled with, three, with one of three temperatures, either 10, 15, or 20 degrees Celsius. And in each one of these arenas, I put in a crayfish of a certain size. And then I plopped in larval stoneflies of certain density. And what I did is I counted the number of stoneflies that they ate and I replaced the ones that they ate so that the um, resource density stayed constant, which is necessary for the type of math that I was doing. And so those, one of those trials looks something like this. Boom. <laughs> All right, so for the data analysis, I'm going to take you back to this equation that describes that saturating feeding rate. And remember that A stands for attack rate, so searching that space, bumping into your resource, and handling time, the time it takes to actually eat it. And so we could break down those two components into um, these equations that incorporate both body size and temperature. So the M's here will stand for the consumer mass, so crayfish mass. And these um, exponents represent or um, this power law relationship that both attack rate and handling time have with mass. And then seen here is how I incorporate that experimental temperature. So this is the Ar Arrhenius equation, and this represents the exponential increase of both attack rate and handling time with temperature. So the goal of this model fitting is to get parameter estimates for these values. So looking at both handling time and attack rate and how body size and temperature affects those measurements. So what I did is I used max likelihood estimation and I fit a full model. So that functional response model with all of this in it. And then from there, I took away the dependence of both body size and temperature on these parameters. And then I used AIC to select the model that best fit my data. So the way that these models are usually structured is that body size is this continuous measure. But what I'm interested in is if the effect of body size matters whether you're a juvenile or an adult. 
So whatever best performing model came from, from that first analysis, I repeated that for only juveniles and only adults. And then I took the likelihoods from those models, combined them, and then compared that to the model that was not stage structured. All right, so just to review the predictions from metabolic theory, um, we predict that attack rate will increase with both body size and temperature, and that handling times will decrease with both body size and temperature. But what I think will happen, given the crayfish's life history, is that these patterns with body size will change, because the bigger they are, the worse off they're supposed to be at getting these bugs, and the longer it's going to take them to eat them. All right. So I'm going to show you a series of three 3D plots, and I'm going to step you through um, kind of what to train your eyes on. So ooh, get my bamboo stick. So on the y-axis, we have the number of stoneflies eaten. Here is um, resource density. So we've seen that plot before. And what I'm adding in is this third dimension, so crayfish size. So just remember that as it goes from this corner to here, it's increasing. The crayfish are increasing in size. And so I'm going to bring back this plot that you saw earlier just to train your eyes to, what to look for. So based on this um, response, we expect this like saturation, right? Like at some point, their consumer is going to get full or can't handle any more prey. And so where we could see that most clearly is back here. And so the way to read this 3D plot is that if you can imagine stacking all of these curves with crayfish size, how does that curve change with body size? Right? And so here are the plots. And what I found is that feeding rates increase with temperature for only the smallest crayfish, for the juveniles. So if we look at the largest crayfish size across temperature treatments, we see that the surface increases, but really that spread of the data points is pretty similar. And when I look at that data further down, it doesn't seem to be like there's much difference between these temperature treatments. But when we focus down here at the smallest crayfish size, we start seeing this bump form, kind of. So what that bump represents is that um, increase in feeding rates. Either their attack rates are going up or their handling times are going down to create that surface. Okay. So those are the patterns with feeding rates um, with body size and temperature. Now I wanted to look at um, the effect on the models that I have. And so remember, I was trying to estimate these parameters and determine which parameters were important in describing their feeding rates. And so briefly going over some model, model results, I found two um, top models that were indistinguishable from each other with an AIC less than two. And these are the model um, parameter estimates. And the details don't matter. What I want to focus on is um, this lack of dependence of temperature on attack rate. Um, and that the parameter, uh, the qualitative results are similar between the two models. But I'm just going to focus on this first model here. So just to summarize that table, I did not find an effect of temperature on attack rates. So we're just going to ignore that. All right, so I found the best performing model from the unstructured models. I then did that again, comparing um, juveniles and adults versus the unstructured model. And I found that the model that included stage structure um, outperformed the one that did not. So this is highlighting the importance of really considering what it means to have different stages along with different sizes in the population. Right. So since I found that the stage structured models were important, I'm going to show you the results of the body size and temperature dependence of attack rate and handling time. Right. So first we'll be looking at patterns of attack rate with body size, and I split it up by juveniles and adults. And so we see that for juveniles, there is a steep decline with body size. So their attack rates are going down really quickly once they hit a certain size. And for adults, it doesn't really matter what size you are. It seems pretty um, even throughout their body sizes, although there is a lot of variation. And as I showed before, there wasn't a pattern with attack rate and handling time. Oh, um, so now we're going to cover handling time. 
looking at patterns with body mass, I see that there is, again, the steep decline with um, handling time for juveniles and not so much, again, for adults, but there is still this negative relationship. And with temperature, they both have this declining relationship. So taking it back to our predictions based on metabolic theory, um, I expect this positive relationship with body size and temperature, but flipped for handling time. And what I found is that there's this decrease in attack rate with body size, which is what I had anticipated based on their life history. For the top model, I did not see a pattern with temperature. And then that this pattern, declining handling times with body size and temperature, um, held true with metabolic theory. So in summary, I found stage-specific resp stage responses to temperature. Um, patterns with body size and attack rate did not hold true, not by predicted by metabolic theory. And that functional response models with stage structure outperform models without stage structure. All right, so what does that all mean outside of crayfish? Okay, so we found that temperature has an effect on feeding rates, but only for the smallest crayfish. And so if temperatures are going to continue to warm, the largest organisms are going to be um, most drastically affected by it. And it's because their metabolic rate is going to continue to increase, but if they can't increase their feeding rates to match that energetic demand, they're actually going to end up starving. And so the, for ectotherms, it would help them to actually be smaller body sizes. So following, or predicted by Bergman's rule or the temperature size rule, so that smaller organisms are found in warmer temperatures. Um, this physiological change to being smaller, either because smaller body organisms have a higher body size, but, or a higher surface area to body ratio, so it's easier for them to expel heat, or there's other um, physiological changes as you are smaller. Either way, the shift towards smaller body sizes are going to change species interactions and change the structure and dynamics of communities. All right, so for the first chapter, we focused on feeding rates. And now for the second chapter, I'm going to focus on what happens once a consumer has its food and the communities that reside within them. So microbial ecology is a growing field as scientists begin to understand the importance of microbes on both human and animal health. But despite its importance, um, information about uh, dynamics, persistence, community assembly is not very well known. As Dr. Ian Moreland said, our abilities to describe these communities is just like saying fish live in water. So we have a long way to go, but we can leverage ideas from ecology um, to understand how these communities change over time. And for my purposes, I specifically looked at um, meta-community theory. And so this theory examines how the dispersal of organisms between communities um, alters local and regional dynamics. And a key component, or one of the key components to metabolic, or sorry, to meta-community theory is the species sorting paradigm. And so there are local environments with environmental gradients that are suitable for certain types of species. So we could um, use crayfish as a study system to see that. So if we imagine this regional species pool, so all this um, bacterial taxa that are available in the environment, and we can imagine crayfish as hosts. So they have these internal environments that are suitable for not all, but some of these microbes. And there's a few ways that their microbial communities could change. So first, how do they get their microbes to begin with? Well, maybe the microbes attached to their food items. These different types of crayfish, juveniles and adults, maybe have different diets so that they're consuming different microbial communities. Communities, And the microbes that get there, only some of them could persist. And so there could be traits within the host that could affect that persistence. One of the ways could be whether that host is a juvenile or, or an adult. So is there something about their physiology, their hormones, the difference between growth and reproduction that causes changes to their microbiome, or their differences between sexes. 
So for crayfish, for females, they carry their eggs for a few months and then they carry their live young for about a month after that. And then for males and crayfish, they are the more aggressive of the two. So is there something about the different types of stresses that they encounter that affect their microbial communities? So the goal of this chapter is to first describe the microbial community composition within their guts, on their foods, and in the aquatic habitats in which they live. Measure the alpha and beta diversity of crayfish gut microbiota between diet treatments. And three, determine the effect of life stage and sex on gut microbial communities. Um, so there's a lot to cover here. I'm only going to focus on broad scale patterns, but if you're interested in looking at more of the, the models that I ran and the stats that I ran, let's talk later. All right, so as Mark said, I did this chapter in Sweden at Uppsala University with my collaborators Richard Svanbach and Javier Idovarg. And I worked here in Lake Erken, which is Uppsala University's field station. And the reason why I went to Sweden, well, one, to go to Sweden, why not? But two, our native crayfish from here was introduced to Northern Europe. And so back in the 70s, their noble crayfish fishery was declining because of this fungal pathogen, the crayfish plague, that attaches onto their gills, basically suffocates them. So because crayfish are such an important resource um, in Northern Europe, they brought over our crayfish over there. But it turns out that our crayfish were carriers of the plague and they were spreading it, but they weren't affected by it. So that started in the 70s and there's, um, there's some movement now to try to restore these natural populations. Um, but it presented an interesting opportunity to try to um, look at microbes um, and their dynamics over in Sweden with the hope that we could compare across continents. I didn't get to that part, but that's the idea. All right. So being here in Lake Erkin, I worked with Natravatan to collect the crayfish. And so once I um, collected them with the fishermen, I froze a subset of them. So 40 went straight from the field to the freezer and the other 80 went back to the lab. And so in each aquarium, I had either a juvenile or an adult crayfish. They were either male or female, which I determined by um, counting the number of pleopods that they have. And then each crayfish had one of two diets. They either ate only algae or they ate only mussels. And they did that for four weeks. And at the end of the four weeks, I froze them all until I dealt with them later. So not only do I have um, crayfish gut samples, I also sampled the food that they ate in the wild um, and the types of water that they lived in. So I had water samples from Lake Erkin and lab water um, that they were in during the course of the experiment. So from these samples, I did a DNA extraction um, and then I used 16S amplification. And so what this means is that within the DNA, there's a section of it that codes for ribosomal RNA. And so the reason why uh, microbial ecologists use this is that um, you're going to be able to find that in bacterial taxa. So you know that you're dealing with bacteria. But within that region or within that section, there are variable regions. So those variable regions let you know what type of taxa you're dealing with. And so I worked with the V4 region. And so once I had all those sequences, I processed it, them in R uh, using data too. Right. And so now I'm just going to look at broad patterns in taxa between these treatments. So what's represented here is a heat tree. So it's basically a phylogenetic tree that's weighted by prevalence. So in dark blue, that represents that taxa was found in 100% of crayfish diets down to the lightest color, which is 10%. So there's a lot to look at here. But what I want to focus on are two <coughs> prominent phyla. First of the, one of those is being proteobacteria and the three classes, alpha, beta, and gamma proteobacteria. And specifically in order, um, enterobacteriales. And so this is a common um, bacteria that is found in invertebrate hindguts. And it's known to help out with plant assimilation. And so whether it deals with um, amino acid synthesis or assimilation of plant compounds, I believe that this taxa allows um, crayfish to really get 
energy or nutrients or whatever it needs from plant material, which is especially helpful if a juvenile ends up eating algae, which it probably shouldn't uh, if it's trying to grow, but it's able to get whatever energy resources it needs to grow. The second most common um, taxa that I found were from acuities, and they were twice as common in adults as they were in juveniles. And the, this phyla is associated with material breakdown. And so two orders, Lactobacillales, this is known for plant decomposition, and Clostridiales, known for amino acid degradation. So it looks like these gut bacteria are helping out with digestion, and the type of taxa that help out with digestion might be related to the types of diets that they have as they go from juveniles to adults. All right, and now I'm going to look at the community composition um, for the different types of crayfish guts, what they ate, and the waters that they lived in. So first we're looking at crayfish um, guts broken up into the diet treatments, so ones that were in the lab that only ate algae ones that were just taken from the wild, and ones that only fed on mussels. And what we see here is this dominance of this purple bar, so proteobacteria, which is to be expected because it's very common in aquatic systems. But the thing that stands out here is this, pre or, um, this appearance of firmicutes, so this yellow bar that we only find in the wild crayfish and not ones in the lab. So looking at, their water, looking at the waters that they lived in, both the lake and the lab, we don't see as much of that purple bar, so not so much um, proteobacteria, but we see this increase in actinobacteria in lake water versus the lab. And now we're going to look at their prey items, so both algae and mussels. And the first thing that stands out to me is that it looks an awful, sim a lot like um, the bacteria that's found in crayfish guts, so this dominance of proteobacteria. So these are the two diet items that are common in the field and what I used for their lab experiment, but I also collected a coronamid, so this is fly larvae, that I also found in their stomachs in the wild, but I didn't use for the experiment. And we see um, the presence of firmicutes, which we only see in the presence of the wild crayfish. And so what this suggests to me is that maybe there's other animal sources that crayfish get this bacteria from, and that their gut microbes look an awful lot like what they're eating and not so much the waters that they live in. So quickly looking at um, the number of taxa that are in each of uh, these treatments. So just the number of bacterial taxa um, within algae, wild, and mussels. And I find that there's no clear difference between them. So the number of taxa present in their guts doesn't matter between what they ate or if they're a juvenile or an adult. So that number seems to stay consistent. But I found that the composition changes quickly. So what I'm about to show you is a Venn diagram looking at the number of unique taxa between mussel diets in the yellow, algae in the red, and wild crayfish in the blue. And these numbers represent the number of taxa found um, within each of those segments. And I found that there's only 8% overlap between these three treatments. So this experiment only ran for four weeks, and it looks like their gut microbe composition changed rather quickly. And based on the models that I'm not going to show today, I found that diet and stage only explain about 10% of the variation in their microbial communities. So in summary, I found that taxa found in their guts aid in both plant and animal digestion, and the importance of each one of them might depend on what stage that crayfish is in. The gut microbial community composition reflects those of its prey items and not so much of the waters that they came from, and that their microbial communities change rather quickly. However, I did find low explanatory power in the models that I used. And so another component of metacommunity theory is that dispersal between communities. And so what I had done in my experiment, I had isolated the crayfish. And so maybe studies in the future could specifically look at connectivity between hosts and how that affects um, not only internal community dynamics, but the dynamics between each one of these um, habitats. 
All right, so what are the ecological consequences of stage structure with gut microbes? So I think that the physiological differences between juvenile and adult crayfish influence the role of diet. And so juvenile, juveniles are the stage in which they molt the most frequently because they're growing. And in order to grow, they need to remove their exoskeleton. And when they do so, they actually remove their entire gut lining. And so maybe um, by having gone, going through this process so quickly and so frequently, by removing their gut lining, they're resetting their microbiome, possibly. And then over the course of my experiment, I did this over late summer. And so I could see that the females were filled with eggs that they were ready to extrude um, to reproduce. And so maybe there is this change physiologically for um, adults and then specifically for females um, to be able to go through this reproduction. And maybe that has this change on their microbiome as well. All right, so we've seen how animals eat. We've seen what happens inside of them when they do eat. And now we're gonna focus on how their active eating affects ecosystem processes. So species interactions and ecosystem function are tightly linked as the trophic connections alter nutrient cycling, decomposition, and energy flows in the system. And the food web shown here represents the one that I studied in our freshwater streams. So it's a story that we've seen already. So juveniles eat mostly bugs, adults eat mostly leaves. Um, but by adults eating bugs that eat those leaves, they have this indirect interaction um, with leaf decomposition. And what's not well known is how introduced species alter those interactions. And so if we think back to the introduction talking about increasive species, What's known about species invasions is that they are going to reduce native biota more than native um, consumers. And so I had the opportunity to address these questions using the ring crayfish. So this is Thaxonius neglectus neglectus. It's been found in southern Oregon in the Rogue and the Umpqua since the 1970s. And it was just found in the Willamette River Basin in 2015. So even though it's been around for a while, the things that we know are that wherever they're found, our signal crayfish, our native crayfish are not found. And that is the extent of the ecological studies on them. So what I wanted to know is the effect of species and stage on both aquatic invertebrate community structure and leaf litter breakdown. And by community structure, I wanted to know their effect on these different invertebrate groups. And so we could break down um, aquatic invertebrate groups by the roles that they have in ecosystems. They could either be predators, so bugs that eat other bugs. They could be shredders, so similar to crayfish, they're the ones that eat leaf litter, break them down, and break them down into small particles that are then available for collectors that collect those particles. And there's also scrapers, so these are animals that scrape off algae off of rocks. Right. I also expect crayfish to have direct and indirect effects on leaf litter breakdown. So not only are they eating the leaf litter, but they're affecting other bugs that also eat that leaf litter. All right, so to do this experiment, um, myself with help of IB grad students in exchange for tacos, uh, constructed these cages, which then I deployed down at the Rao River, um, kind of close to Eugene. And so in each one of these cages, it had one type of crayfish species, either ringed, the introduced one, or our native signal. One of two stages, either juveniles or adults, and four leaf packs, two of them that are open so that it's, uh, it's exposed, um, available for crayfish, and two of them that were covered in mesh. And so that was to prevent crayfish from getting those leaves and to allow other invertebrates to do so. So I ran this experiment for six weeks and at the end, we collected these cages, we rinsed them out, we collected the bugs, identified them down to family in the lab and also took dry, um, dry weight measurements of the leaves. 
So going over my predictions, I expect there to be stage-specific effects on both aquatic invertebrate communities and leaf litter breakdown. So I expected juveniles to reduce aquatic invertebrate abundance more so than adults, thereby having an effect on leaf litter breakdown. And for adults, I expected them to remove more leaf litter than juveniles. And then based on what we know about invasive species, I expected the ring crayfish to have a greater impact on both leaves and bugs than our native signals. So what I'm going to show here are a series of plots looking at each of those functional feeding groups. And this first plot is going to focus on just the overall bug abundance within each one of these cages. So they're grouped by species, both ring and signal. And the colors represent the ontogenetic, ontogenetic stage, either juvenile or adult. And what I found was that stage was important in determining how many bugs were around. And specifically, that there are more bugs in treatments with juveniles than with adults, which is counter to what I expected. For the shredders, I found that there were more shredders with juveniles than adults, which follows that pattern of overall bug abundance. But with the other functional feeding groups, it didn't matter what species or what stage was in these cages, their numbers did not differ. All right, now we're gonna look at leaf litter breakdown. I'm gonna show you the same three plots, but I'm gonna highlight different parts about them. So the first thing I wanna show is for these open leaf pack treatments, how leaf litter changed as a function of stage. And I found that there were more there's more leaf litter removed where there were adults versus where there were juveniles. And in fact, there was an 8% difference between those two treatments. The same plot, but now I'm coloring it by species. So the orange is ringed, the blue is signal. And I found that species also had an effect on leaf litter breakdown. So there was more leaf litter consumed by signal crayfish than by ringed, which is opposite to what I had expected. And in fact, there was a 7% difference between the amount of leaf litter, leaf litter broken down by signal crayfish relative to ringed. Okay. And now I'm including the data from the mesh packs, so the ones that excluded crayfish. And I saw that they did not have an indirect effect on leaf litter breakdown. So even though the bugs or the crayfish couldn't get to them, the bugs didn't eat as much leaf litter as I had expected them to. All right, so in summary, I found results that were counter to what I had expected. So I did not see fewer bugs with treatments with juveniles. And I did not see this indirect interaction with leaf litter breakdown. Um, but I did see more leaf litter consumed or broken down by adult crayfish. So a few reasons for this discrepancy are, one, maybe adults are actually eating the bugs, and I didn't measure that. Two, um, it's possible that adults emit, um, well, crayfish do emit chemical cues, and it's possible that crayfish emit more chemical cues than juveniles do. And so maybe there's this threshold for bugs to be able to recognize that there is indeed a predator in their midst. Um, and three, Crayfish are pretty big, and so their act of moving around in streams actually kicks up sediment and causes bugs to dissipate. So it could be one of these three possibilities. And I think one of the interesting things that I found is that the ecological role of rain crayfish in my experiment was not the same as signal crayfish. In fact, they did less than what I thought they would. And so in areas where signal crayfish are being displaced by ring crayfish, we may be actually losing ecosystem processes and function. And so in the plots that I showed you, in each leaf pack, there was only about like a 0.7 to 0.8 difference in that leaf litter. But it turns out to be a lot of energy if you think about it. So 0.7 to 0.8 grams of leaf litter could translate, oh, so that amount of leaves could feed things like chironomids. And so each chironomid weighs something like 0.01 grams, and they could eat their weight in leaf litter. So that amount of leaf litter translates to 80 chironomids, and that's just the amount of energy in one of these leaf packs, times four in a cage, times a bigger stream. That's actually a lot of energy um, 
difference between when we have single crayfish versus when we don't. And just as an aside, I had an amazing intern with me, Wendy Safarn, that looked at the mechanisms of signal crayfish displacement in the lab. So what she did is she had both signal and ring crayfish fight over food and space. And so if you want to talk about that, come find me later. Right. So the primary focus of my dissertation was to bring the attention to the important but often ignored role of ontogenetic variation. Today we've seen how stage structure affects population dynamics through feeding rates, microbial community structure, um, as well as ecosystem processes. And this highlights the importance of incorporating stage structure into our studies of nature, and especially for applied efforts. Because if we want to manage our natural resources, we have to remember that everything eats, but not everything eats the same way. And that's my research. So being here for six years, I have a long list of acknowledgments, probably longer than any other defense this term, so stay tuned. All right, so first, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources. I've had a tremendous amount of support to do all the research that I've done everywhere that I've gone. So I am incredibly thankful for especially the NSF and the additional funding opportunities that they provided me. And I just want to thank my committee members, um, Felipe, for joining this term. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Rushali, Jason, Mark, and Dana, thank you for your time and your support and your willingness to help me out when I needed it. I also want to thank the integrative biology staff, all the T's plus Jane. Uh, we like wouldn't be able to function as grad students and get paid if it weren't for you. So thank you so much. And I, I have to, I can't even say how grateful I am to have been in your lab, Mark. Um, just the amount of patience and support you've shown me through the ugliest code and the worst of drafts. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, and I'm grateful that you've given me the space to explore the type of scientist that I want to be. And I have many more things to say, but I'm just going to summarize of that in those two sentences. Right. Next, I'd like to thank my lab, past and present, who have been just incredible support in the field through many practice talks, just through just trying to figure out how to start up a lab with a new PI. It's, it's been a great experience. I also want to thank my bug brigade. So these are the interns that worked with me. And without them, I would not have a third chapter at all. I especially want to thank Wendy. She did an incredible job with her honors project. Um, Mateo for really pulling the weight at the end when I really needed those samples to be done. And for Cindy who processed a lot of water samples um, in a chapter that I did not have a chance to present today. So totally grateful for all of you. Um, and as Mark said, I spent my first year just hopping on any field crew that I could find to learn how to do stream work. So I am forever grateful for Dave and Doug for just showing me what a stream is and how to catch fish and maybe sometimes catch them upside down. Really thankful for that. Um, Bill Girth for taking me out into the field and teaching me about bugs. Um, and I also had an opportunity, a couple opportunities to learn about how science could be used outside of academia. And for that, I'm really grateful for Deb Merchant at the Marys River Watershed Council and for Sarah Colasar and Lisa Cox for giving me that professional development opportunity that I couldn't get here. I'm also really grateful for the people that I met at Uppsala University, specifically everyone in animal ecology for helping me out when I had no idea what I was doing, um, especially my lab mate, Javi, who had such positivity even though our PCRs wouldn't work, and now I know what that means and building shrines for them to work. <laughs> I see you now. Um, and just being such a positive force, especially when I thought I didn't have any data for like half a year, so thank you. Um, and to Marcus Morrow, uh, before coming here, I had many great mentors in my road in ecology. And I first want to thank um, the SDSU grad, ecology grad students, um, specifically working with Kevin Hovel and his grad students. I was responsible for maybe more things than I should have been, but I'm grateful for it. Um, I want to thank Colin. He's the reason why I'm in the Northwest in the first place. 
and Max for all of your advice and support, and all the other grad students that were excellent role models of how to work hard and play hard. Um, and especially Levi, my mentor, who came all the way up from California. Um, I would not be in science if it weren't for him. Um, I also wouldn't know about Globachi if it weren't for him. <laughs> and I tell you this all the time, but thank you so much. You've had just such a tremendous impact on my life, and I can't thank you enough. Um, I also want to thank my other science family supporters from my time at Hatfield. It was almost a decade ago, but I know that it's been great to still see you at conferences and run by data with you. Thanks for having my back. And I want to thank a number of people who were not grad students and indeed showed me a life outside of grad school and showed me how beautiful a place Oregon could be. So Deshaun, Amy, um, Travis, Amanda, and Shane. Thanks for getting me outside. I want to thank so many dogs <laughs> that <laughs> when I was at my lowest, they were just always so happy to see me and really brought my spirits up. So thank you for the naps and the cuddles. They mean the world to me. Um, and that was especially important because it's, it's been, I will say that being brown in Oregon has had its challenges. And when I first moved here, there wasn't really a community to support someone like me. And I'm grateful for the people who have come together to have that community and to make this place better. And so I am thankful for Alex Davis for building that community with me, for Javi, Anne, Antonio, Megan, and Shumpe. You are doing amazing work here, and I, I can't wait to see what happens next. I'm, it's a lot of work, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, I want to thank Elise, I want to thank you for your friendship lasagnas, for feeding me when I couldn't feed myself, and for editing so many awful drafts. Um, and really for helping me stand up for what's right and doing so in your own work. You've been a great ally. Um, and talking about feeding, thanks to Brat for having the best goat in Corvallis and also feeding me. Um, I've had many silly adventures with great people here. Um, so. Thanks for an amazing time. I especially want to thank Felipe for all of your help and your sass, for Pat always scheming, and for Javi for being like a big brother to me for the past six years, and you'll still be that when I'm gone too. Um, I'd also like to thank my sparring partner, <laughs> my business partner, <laughs> and my partner, partner Alex, for indulging my love of martial arts and spreadsheets and for bringing a great company in the kitchen. Um, thanks for everything. And then I also want to thank my swole mates, my academic big sisters, Alex Davis and Allie Barner. They are two of the strongest and smartest women that I know. Thank you for all of your support, either for like moral support when I was feeling down or for helping me pick up a lipstick shade. Either way, you're always there for me. Um, and in the words of Dominic Toretto, I don't have friends, I have family. And I have had an amazing cohort family during my time here. And I, I have too much to say about every one of you here. So I just want to say that you've been an amazing group of best friends. And I can confidently say that there will never be as great of a zoology cohort ever again. <laughs> So family, it's, it's such an umbrella term. I have many family members to thank. Um, BioFam, A1, A2, Dragons, and my actual family. Thank you for taking care of me when I'm home and for cheering for me when I'm not. And lastly, I want to thank my parents to my mom who really instilled that passion for food and party planning and for my dad who got me to talk to strangers and reminding me that I could do anything. And I'm sorry if my accent's bad. I practiced with Tita Feli last night. Habang ako ay tumatanda ay napagtatanto ang lahat ng nagawa at ginagawa niyong dalawa para sa akin. Hindi ko kayo mapapasalamatan ng lubos para sa lahat ng inyong pagmamahal at suporta. Para sa pagputad at kung saan man ako daldalhin ng mga pang Arab ko. And that's it.
one quick question, sure. Especially if you've got rent. But anyone wants to get that one question in? Yeah, I'm Brian. So do crayfish grow isometric, isometrically or allometrically? Do you think that that might change in species that grow a different way in terms of like their stage construction? Ooh, good question. Um, I think they grow allometrically and there are, this is a debate in the metabolic theory world as to what type of equations to use to describe not only how metabolism changes if your growth is different between like isometric versus allometric, um, and then the, how that then translates to things like feeding rates or other biological processes. So, good question. <laughs> well, then, should you guys go? So, uh, let's uh, thanks again. Thanks. thanks. I try to find you early.